Hello and welcome to the Annie Altman Show, the podcast, season five. Welcome to the ninth episode in the Compassion C series. Today, I am so grateful to be here with Dr. Courtney Tracy, the truth doctor on social media. Courtney has a healing center, has worked doing one-on-one -on -one therapy, and has a podcast, Your Unconsciousness is Showing, and so many things. And I'm so grateful to have you here on the show. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I would love for you to share a little bit in your own words about about you, about what makes you feel like you and whatever feels relevant of how we got to this moment of podcasting together. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. thank you so much. <laughs> no, no pressure at all. So again, my name is Dr. Courtney Tracy. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a doctor of clinical psychology. I'm known on social media as the truth doctor, and we will get into more of what that means on this episode today. Um, I own an adult addiction treatment center currently in Santa Barbara, California, and I have a lot of social media platforms um, and online platforms where I provide free mental health courses because I don't want anyone to have any barriers for psychoeducation on how their mind works and how they can get better from their symptoms. Of course, therapy is ideal because you want to work with a professional, but at the same time, education is power, and so I provide those for free. And then, as you mentioned, I do have a podcast, Your Unconscious is Showing, where I help people dive deep into what the unconscious is and how it's showing and everything that they do. And the point for me to be the truth doctor, you know, my name is Courtney. I, I, feel, I, I feel like Courtney, um, but people see me as the truth doctor. And, you know, the point of the truth doctor, which I know we'll get into later, but it's really... Sometimes people show up as characters for others. And for me, the truth doctor is essentially a character for myself and for other people. So I always speak my truth and I always encourage people and help people find their own. And so I may be a doctor of psychology, but a lot of people don't call themselves doctors unless they're like a medical doctor. And I chose to include the word doctor in my title because a doctor is essentially someone that heals something. And what I'm trying to do is help uncover and repair the truth that each person has within themselves. And so I have this white coat, like a doctor coat that I covered in patches. And it's sort of like a pun on, you know, I'm not impersonating a doctor, that's illegal. I do have a doctorate. But at the same time, it's there to say that there can be creativity in healing and there are things to heal within the human psyche that a lot of people don't talk about, you know? And so I'm fine with using my story to help other people learn how to tell theirs and uncover what's really there. Ooh. It's so inspiring and I so love the things that you put out for their, to me they feel like a, you are being authentic about mental health, about feelings, about the whole spectrum of humaning while mm -hmm. also Keeping it light doesn't feel exactly like the right word. Keeping it in a digestible format for people to give them a nugget of something to help them continue on their own understanding and uncovering themselves. Exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, when I'm sitting, when I'm providing therapy treatment to someone, the client may feel like it's me helping them, but it's not. Because if the client was closed off, then I wouldn't be able to help them. And so we are all capable of healing ourselves to some degree. Of course, there's symptomology where you need a professional. Of course, there's medical doctors, if it's a psychiatric issue or whatever, there's stuff going on. But at the same time, it's like, if you don't understand what's going on with you enough to do something about it, then you're not gonna be able to be helped. And so it's like, here's the information, do with it what you will. And if I'm giving information where I feel like if it resonates with someone, then they should go see someone, then I'll say that. I'll say, if this sounds like you're going through this, then you should talk to someone because this video obviously isn't going to cure those symptoms. <laughs> totally. And being really real about that of this isn't a replacement for some other therapy. This is an additional therapy tool. And like you brought up too of creativity, I'm glad so early to bring that up, especially when we're creating a podcast here that this is its own form of therapy that 
there's so many ways to heal yourself. Yes, there is. You, there really is. When we're not creative, when we don't have an outlet, when we're not connected to who we really are, it shows. It shows in stress. It shows in making the wrong decisions. It shows in anger and anxiety. And like, there's a reason, you know, some people think music therapy or art therapy or dance therapy, or movement therapy or whatever. Some people think that it's bullshit. And it's like, not, it's like, it's just not like we are all the way back like I don't know thousands of years ago we were dancing and we were drawing on walls and caves and we were finding ways to express ourselves because it, one it helps us pass the time like and be engaged in life than just eating and sleeping and eating and sleeping you know but it also gives us the ability to figure out who we really are and what we like and how we express ourselves and so podcasting means a lot to me meeting other people means a lot to me using my voice to talk to whoever's listening to this or watching this means a lot to me and any creative everyone's a creative but a creative is someone who has embraced that part of themselves and so and i admire that in each person mm -hmm. very well said and i admire you embracing that in you and then putting that out there to encourage people like you were saying to to do that too and I'm glad too you brought up that that paradox that I know I come into all the time of loving and hating and also being like what the fuck is what is this that I'm the only one who can heal myself and also I need other people and how are those both true that that's true for everyone and and how do we reconcile that and I, I have no answers besides making things to process being okay with it yes you know what I really love that you just said that that I don't have the answers, but I love creating things to reconcile. In fact, that's true. And I love that because so many people, they just want answers. I get like, that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, dude, me too. Like, oh my God, it's just human nature because literally our brains fill gaps. It's like neurobiologically, neuropsychologically, we want things to be whole. Like if we see a circle and it's broken open, we want it closed. And sometimes like there's studies where even like our visual processing and our memory, like I always say this, like the, there's this study where they showed like the, just this image to people and half of the people, the bike had two wheels and the other half it had one. And it's like a lot of the people would, that had the bike with one wheel said that the bike had two because one, we use our past experiences and two, we just assume and we want it to have two because that's how we remember a bike. And so, and that's the case if you think about any answer to anything of like, why? Why is that the case? We want to know if it's one or the other. And I love that you said that you just create things to accept that that's not the case versus trying to continue to find ways to figure out if it's black or white or all or nothing or right or wrong or whatever it is. That was beautiful. Thank you. I, I learned that from experience and keep learning from experience that when I start going into that, getting hooked into like, well, what's the black and white thing? And how do I define this? That it doesn't feel good but mentally, physically, spiritually. And my, like mm -hmm. this, this feels not, this is unfun. This is unproductive. Like, right. like what you could, why don't you go dance? <laughs> like, yeah, no, really. Yeah. And how do we use that then as, well, I guess use it as a tool while also still, being mindful of both how we're using that tool and then also for me that same sort of black and white thinking tendency that can come up to be like well I'm going to be really prescriptive about my yoga practice then and like this is my this is my tool instead and it's like okay hey like human what are you right what are you doing now <laughs> exactly yeah yeah and truth really continuing to come up as that theme of like if there's anything that I am looking for or being guided by or towards is what is my truth and how do I, how do I accept that for me, including the parts of truth that are saying, well, I don't really know what the truth is. What does that mean? Right. That's complicated. I mean, the truth is really hidden. I feel like, like from the moment that we're born, we're absorbing other people's thoughts and other people's experiences. 
and then our own thoughts that are affected by their thoughts and their experiences and then our thoughts affected by our experiences that are affected by other people's thoughts and it's like who are we like do we really know you know do we really know after the years of society and our family and our own internal belief systems altering how we view ourselves in the world the truth is very very far down and but we don't think that we walk around like i know what the fuck is going on in the world i know who i am and we're all very disconnected to each other and to ourselves and so that's one of the reasons why i have this platform is because i knew that i was fucking suffering in my own stuff for a really long time and self-sabotaging and blaming everyone else and it was a lot of other people's faults as well, but it also was my inability to accept that even if they played a major role in my life, I'm now the one playing the role. I'm now the one that's letting that be the case. And of course there's situations of system, systematic racism and oppression. And those are things where you know maybe those aren't forgivable. And maybe you can only go, you know, this, this manifestation thing, I fully believe in it and a lot about it. And you can only manifest so much if you are oppressed. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. But at the same time, I think we can uncover our truth. And then it's what do we do about it? And are other people ready to hear it? Oof. Oof. Like, are we ready to share it? And, and also who is it gonna be received by and how? And how does that guide us then to our people, quote unquote. Yeah. Will you share a little bit about your journey from like how you started the, your podcast and TikTok and Instagram and taking the things from your own experience of your own personal healing, ongoing process and your one-on-one -on -one experience to say, to stand in your truth now of creating videos and making content and running the center to, to help people on a in a different way and on a different scale and yeah. not that one scale is better or worse right we need everyone we need people in all the places for you to stand in your truth of this is where i belong in this tapestry Absolutely. of humans yeah completely so i mean when i was younger i wanted to be somebody else i feel like a lot of people feel that way and i wanted like I wasn't really taken care of and what that taught me was how not to take care of myself and how not to accept myself and so i spent a lot of my life trying to be someone else and then and then i eventually got to a place where i thought that i was doing better and then i realized that i was just now a version that other people wanted me to be of who i really was and i was like oh so this is why i'm masking myself with drugs and alcohol and isolating and thinking, you know, even when I was getting my master's degree, they were like, so are you gonna go into individual therapy? And I was like, no, I don't have empathy. I was like, I think I'm a psychopath. And they were like, what? They were like, what are you talking about? Why are you gonna go into the field of mental health and psychology if you don't think that you have empathy? And one thing that I think would be great for someone to take away from this is that I realized that one of my truths was that it wasn't that I didn't have empathy for other people. It was that I didn't have compassion for myself. And I was so disconnected from my own feelings that it unintentionally disconnected me from other people's. So it wasn't that I was a psychopath. It's that I was fucking traumatized. And that's a huge realization that I had to come to terms with. And when I realized that that was my truth, then it allowed me, gave me the ability to open up my door, open up all the doors to all the stuff I was running from in my life and to find out my real truth. And so I was working at the center in Malibu for three and a half years, very materialistic, and I didn't want to work there anymore. So from, I guess that's just a great way to summarize it. It's just very materialistic, very externally motivated. And so I opened up my own center in Santa Barbara. It's called Good Heart Recovery because I think everybody has a good heart and it's just masked by the lack of truth that they get to experience in their own lives. So then they run 
from the truth that they've been told that they know isn't actually true. And so then I started doing individual therapy as well. And, you know, I was only like, I was only able to do that. You know, of course I did it through my master's. I did it in the beginning of my licensure. I did it at this other treatment center. And then I started doing private practice for like eight months. And I just, I didn't like being confined into a room with someone sitting across from me and being like, okay, what intervention am I going to use? How am I going to document this in the chart so that it seems evidence-based so that it makes sense? And like, it's like, I just didn't like how calculated it had to be, even though I was a scholar for 19 years of my life. Like, obviously I'm including like grade school. So I'm like, maybe not a scholar my whole life, but in school for a lot of my life. So of course I like structure and I like responsibility. And so when I, but when I got to actually sitting with another human being and trying to help them address their suffering from the lack of truth that they have in their life, I was like, this is not the way for me. This isn't the way for me. And it felt isolating for me. I had isolated my whole life. And I was like, now I'm just sitting in the room across from one other person. And it's, I feel myself isolating again, like internally. I'm like, okay, so this isn't going to work. And so then I was like, now what am I supposed to do? You know, because I didn't want to work one-on-one -on -one in my center because it'd be weird to be providing therapy to someone and then also have them want to talk about their insurance bill. That's like, it's just different. I mean, obviously that happens in private practice, but it's a little different when you're in a whole program and your family's involved and you have a DUI court case and it's just your whole life is wrapped up into this really serious program that you're in. So it'd be hard to be administrative and clinical. So I was like, what do I do? And then I saw these social media accounts and I was like, people are really getting their message out this way. So I talked to my cousin who did social media and I was like, I think I want to do this. And part of the reason why I agreed was because she was willing to help me. And she was like the shyest family member that we had like we come from a Mexican family lots of grandkids lots of aunts and uncles and she was the shyest one and she ended up going to film school doing Demi, Lovato, Demi Lovato's music video starting her own company and I'm like what I'm like if she can do it and put herself out there then I can do it and so she guided me all along the way and I started with Instagram and then went on to TikTok and and I realized that you know, I always wanted to do like a hip hop class. I always wanted to do acting. I always wanted to put myself out there, but I was so traumatized, like I mentioned, that it, it was just easier to hide away. So then I found the app and I'm like, there's authenticity on this TikTok thing. And now it's like nine months into it. I have 1.2 million followers where I'm sharing my own story and how it relates to anyone else's story and how mental health can be, be all repairing in like every area of your existence and I feel like for anyone listening if you're afraid to be creative and I know we talked a little bit about this before we started filming and if you're afraid to figure out who you really are like if you think about it what you're afraid of happening is already happening like you're already not happy or else you wouldn't be trying to figure out how to be happy and so what's the worst thing that can happen? You, it stays the same? Well, it's not going to stay the same because you're doing something different. And so I would say take the chance because 1.2 million people resonated with my story that I could have kept hidden my whole life. So you never know how impactful you can be. So do it. <laughs> mm, so inspiring and so well phrased of something that I'm guessing had messier parts of it along the way of reckoning with that acceptance of being truthful about your feelings and your experience with with doing it and I can only imagine the the sort of self-talk or all the things of like well I did all of this training for this thing or you know how can I not you know oh like needing to be more grateful for doing this kind of work or that thing or whatever the thoughts were for you that then you loved and listened to and compassionately were truthful with of, okay, well, when do I actually feel like myself? What do I actually enjoy doing? Which is the only way to actually help people. I'm, I'm learning by saying it repeatedly. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I, I think that the human spirit, like 
at our true core, we know when someone's not being authentic. Like, and I talk about this, I was just on this other podcast with a therapist and she was like, I felt like they wanted me to not exist in the room. I felt like they just wanted me, like the profession of mental health, like they wanted me to just be the intervention of CBT for 12 weeks, an hour a week. And it was as if I wasn't allowed to be me. And then she said, well, I, then I didn't see like progress. And she said, then when I threw that standardized workbook and manual out the fucking window and just started embracing the core concepts of the intervention and came authentically and vibed somatically and emotionally with the person in front of me, my clients got significantly better. And I completely agree with that. And so I think that that's something really important to realize too, is like, are you a vessel of who you really are? Or do you actually feel fulfilled, you know? And giving yourself permission to realize that that's how you're gonna help the most people is when you don't make them feel like you don't exist because we are mirroring beings. So if you're acting like you don't exist, you're kind of telling them that about themselves too, which is not helpful. <laughs> No, and that's such a good description of that sort of cold clinical side that can happen in the medical field and then how psychology as a field is navigating sort of how do we weave in art with clinical with all of these things that I, I humans have super sensitive bullshit detectors. We know when someone is bullshitting. We know when we're bullshitting ourselves, although we can believe that it's more comfortable to stay there. Right in the short term and absolutely the the experiences I've had in in my own healing journey have the most transformative ones have been when that real sense of humanity and truthfulness and having therapists having massage therapists having people be real and be honest about where they are in their journey and the fact that they're human too and saying yeah I also don't know what I'm doing and here's things that have helped me and see what helps you exactly yeah I think that as helpers and healers we want to give two messages I think a lot of the times people think that we should only give one which is it's it's possible to get better and this is what it looks like that's one message and some people stop at that and the other one is and I'm also not fucking completely better. And this is what it looks like to be okay with that and to show that. And it, we need both. We need to be met where we're at and be shown where we can go. Not only be shown where we can go so that we feel alone on the journey there. Oof. That is a powerful message and reminder and the yes and that it, that it's both. And, and also for that sort of talking about connection and compassion of remembering that we're, we're in it together, that we're in it with other people, that there's not this point of, oh, I'm healed and I'm done. And I'm like, hello, I'm all better now. Like, <laughs> I wish, but never met someone where that's the case. No. Well, and then for your point too of, of reflecting each other, if I met someone, well, one, if I met someone who was saying that, my bullshit detector would, would be like, really? Like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And also then where is the, it's, that's isolating more than it's connecting because it's someone, it's someone putting themselves above and not in a way of like, here's a hand to help in a way of like, well, I've figured it out. Like, look at, look at my healing rather than this is a process. This is a practice. This is this is ongoing. Yeah, forever. Because the world isn't stagnant. The world is always changing. So you're always going to be changing. You know, I, I was talking to the holistic psychologist two weeks ago, and she said that what she tried to do was create a, like a daily schedule for her life. And she realized that you can't fucking do that. You know, and I feel like that's super important to share because when she said that to me, I was like, like I felt called out. I was like, oh shit, I'm t I've totally been trying to do that recently because I suffer from really severe anxiety, very severe anxiety. It's very physical and physiological. 
and it can be really debilitating. And then it turns into cognitive spiritual anxiety. And I'm like, why am I here? What am I doing? I don't want to get out of bed. And then I feel like shit and don't eat and don't sleep. It's just a terrible cycle. And so I like got this new medication and like online yoga and like all this stuff. And I'm like, Hey, this is what my day is going to look like. <laughs> then the first day that I tried to do that, I realized that I have a two year old toddler and that is not going to fit with having a daily routine. And so everyone in their own way has a two year old toddler. There is something going on in your life that is always going to be ever changing. And even if that's just your own mind, that's that two year old toddler in your life, you have to realize that you need flexibility and you need compassion for yourself in the moment of like the fact that it's a process and the fact that some days are gonna feel like shit and some days are gonna feel wonderfully beautiful and to not judge either one of them as your life, to judge both of them as your life, to be accepting of all of it and averting to none of it and just rest in the fact that you exist because you know, life is a gift. Everyone has said that like growing up and I'm like, life's a gift, that's why they call it the present. And I'm like, that is so dumb. But if you actually think about it, it is a gift. And it's just when you take like the bow tie off of it that makes it seem like some stupid quote that you actually can drop into the fact that it's everything and nothing and that's okay. <laughs> mm. How to really accept that. And I so resonate with that too of like, fuck that quote, like what? And then also being like, oh wait, hold on. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some truth in this. Wow. That thing of depression being in the past and anxiety being in the future and how to be present and that fun game of being not present and then being like, hey, Annie, where's, where's your head and body and how are they coming together? And how much anxiety too, I, I really resonate with that too, that anxiety coming up to say, we need a structure, we need a plan, what is the whatever, how are we going to control this uncontrollable life thing that we didn't, we didn't choose to receive this gift and we don't choose when the gift is over and oh my gosh, let me just spiral into all of these things and like, okay, like I see you anxiety. I, I hear you. Thank right. you for the things that you're doing. <laughs> and you're not, you're not driving the car. You're not the only one here. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up change too, for the, the speaking of structure and me giving my anxiety some sort of <laughs> some scaffolding of the 10 C's of the humanity and change being the one right before compassion and how to have compassion for change being the only constant and this thing that mm -hmm. that keeps happening where yeah you your your two-year-old has a different need on a different day or you have a different need on a different day and and as much as we can be like oh well i get up and i have my tea and i do my yoga and i meditate and i'm just like really is that really what you do every day human like tell me more <laughs> right yeah how's that How's that going for you? And also social media and how that can sort of cloud that, which again is why I really admire your platform and how you put stuff out of shifting that narrative from self-care and, and therapy and truth, not being this like, well, here's me doing my perfect daily routine. And like, here's my YouTube daily routine video of what I do. And I'm like, those videos trigger me so much because I'm like, how long has this been your routine for? And is this really what you do? And like, what happens when you have a human moment? Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Seriously, it's so important. I wish that everybody had to answer those questions. <laughs> I wish like, in, I wish social media would like, I wish Instagram would be like, you know, they're trying to post another like manicured photo and it's like, gives an error. It's like, error, you've posted too many filtered, manu like manufactured photos this week. Try posting a normal one. It's like, find a balance. Like, that'd be pretty nice if they did that. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it'd be controlling as fuck, but it might be really helpful for people. <laughs> yeah, like people get to post what they want and that's part of the beauty of it is that you get to tell your story of your truth and, and then also to that same point of people have a sensitive bullshit detector. And so yeah. at a certain point, people are going to say, oh, wait, hold on, and, and then resonate with things that feel truthful to them, like the stuff that you put out. And they're like, well, this person's actually sharing what they think and feel and believe here and oh my gosh this exists this is out there 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would love to shift to some definitions of words. Sure. In terms of knowing and accepting the truth and it changing of what truth means and what compassion means and how those intersect and overlap with love and acceptance and where the boundaries, where is the overlap? I love this question. And I love it. <laughs> and I want to say that no one's ever asked me this question before. It really asked me to define any of these words. The truth word is a little embarrassing that I haven't thought of the definition yet up until this point. You know, I, the thing is, is I had a cognitive feeling and an emotional feeling of the purpose and what I perceived to be the truth, but I had never come up with a very easy way to describe it to someone, a definition of it. And so I was thinking about this before we came onto filming today and I ran my answers by my husband and I was like, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. I'm like, does this sound like what I believe because we've been together for 15 years he's the one that coined the term the truth doctor and I'm like is this what you meant by it like is this how you see me in my actions of these three things like tell me what you think and he was like I love it and so now I'm going to share it with you so my definition of truth which it's not like these things aren't really deep unless you you know when we put them all together and we think about the concept of them and so for me, the definition of truth is unadulterated reality. And what I mean by that is that from the moment that we are born, we are exposed to a specific environment and a specific language and specific belief systems and behaviors of the people around us and what's okay and what's not okay and who we are, like dress based off of our gender, which I think is fine up until a point with permission if that changes to adjust. Um, but we are, we absorb all these things that are placed on top of what could have been our unadulterated reality. Now we are born as human beings needing support. We're not born like a deer. We just fucking get up and start running, you know, like we can't do that. Like, and like, and, and so we're connected beings and we're absorbent beings because we want to survive and we want to thrive and we want to connect and we want to learn. And in order to do that, we absorb everything around us. So I think that at our core, when someone's doing the work to find their truth, they're trying to find their unadulterated reality. And how is that related to compassion? You know, there's definitions of compassion, like having empathy or sympathy for someone else. And if we take the definition of truth being unadulterated reality, then compassion would be the understanding that we are all living our own versions of adulterated reality. Meaning we have all been exposed to different things and different experiences and different behaviors. And compassion is accepting that there's a reason that someone thinks differently about you or has different exposures to different behaviors and situations. And, and we are compassionate towards whatever their lack of truth may be because of everything that they've experienced in their adulterated reality. And so with that, what is love? Love, taking those two definitions into context, love is connection and fondness towards someone's actual truth, being aware that they have an actual truth of unadulterated reality within them. So connecting to that and being fond to that, and then compassion towards their own version of their adulterated reality. So we're accepting, if you really love someone, like I met my husband when I was 14 years old, okay? We're 30 now, 15 years, over 15 years. Why has it worked? Why has it worked? I truly believe that it's worked. And yeah, we've broken up lots of times. Think about 15 years starting when we were 14. There's been a lot of these. But why has it always worked? And it's worked because I truly believe that we really do connect with that actual truth. And regardless of how life tries to adjust that truth and make us see each other differently and our world constantly changes, we know we have compassion and fondness for the truth within each of us. And we are compassionate and provide love towards all of those adulterated experiences that change us over time. 
So love is compassion and truth. And compassion is accepting that everyone's changed by the world around them. And truth is that, that there is unadulterated reality within us. Call that whatever you want to call it. People call it spirit. People call it the soul. People call it divine energy, whatever you want to call it. That's the truth. And so put whatever label you want on it, whatever makes you feel better because we all have a preference because we're humans, but it's there. And I think it's really important that we understand the connection between truth, compassion, and love. You can't take one of those things out of the equation or the ability to see one of those things out of the equation and you're probably suffering a lot. And I think to have real love, you have to have an awareness of truth, even if you're still searching for it, and compassion for yourself and other people. <laughs> so much. <laughs> Damn. Wow. I really, wow. 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 I, it means so much to me that you, you took the time to reflect in, in such a way and to give that gift to me and the podcast and people here listening about taking all of your personal and clinical and online and all of these experiences to give a simple, straightforward definition of these things and how they how they overlap is mm -hmm. wow i'm reminded too of a therapist who said to me once embrace reality and that feeling really related to what you're saying of unadulterated truth that mm -hmm. there is that thing before it's been touched like you were saying too by all of other people's the the whole clusterfuck of everyone's expectations mm -hmm. perspective all of it mm -hmm. What are your thoughts and feelings on sort of like cliche phrases with truth of the truth, the truth hurts and the truth will set you free? Do those, do those resonate with you or how do you feel about those? Yeah. So when I think about those, um, I feel like a lot of people, you know, okay. So when it comes to like quotes, I think that people can become really turned off by them because they think that like, it doesn't fully explain, you know, like the truth of life, you know, and they say like the truth will set you free. And, you know, someone who's experienced pain from truth may feel like that did not set me free. That made me feel like shit, you know? And so I think, you know, then they're like, maybe they'll only adhere to believing in the quote that truth hurts and maybe vice versa. And I think that they're both true. I mean, I think they both, makes sense. And the reason that the truth will set you free is because it will hurt. I think that that's why, because we are holding pain and suffering and fear. And the only way to let that go is to look at it. Like that's the only way to let it go. And so I think they're both true. I, I resonate you know, here's the thing is like, I have compassion literally for everything in the world. Like I understand everyone's perspective. Like I like, and this might be, this may be a little sentence that I would not want to be taken out of context, but don't out of context people. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> um, like someone who is racist, for example, totally unacceptable. And there's a reason there's a reason why they think that and they feel that way. And, and, and yes, you know, the human psyche, when we're given new information, if we don't want to believe it, we won't. And so to a degree, it becomes a choice to have those perspectives. So I understand it's, it's a personal decision and it's a, it's a moral obligation to, if you're born with these beliefs and these systems above you that you work to dismantle that within yourself. And we have to understand that there's a reason that someone feels that way. They weren't born feeling like that. Their environment made them like that. And who made the environment like that? And it goes on and on and on and on and on and all the way up. And you realize that at the core of this division and at the core of our internal suffering is that humans forever have been running from fear and pain and suffering. That's why, that's why we've divided. That's why we have power issues. That's why we cheat on each other and lie to each other and lie to ourselves and steal from people. And that's why all of these things happen is because we're running from internal or external fear, internal or external suffering. 
And so the truth is uncovering all of that and being like, oh, this is terrible. This hurts a lot. I can't believe people feel this way or think this thing. And we have to look at it in order to be, you know, set free, which is basically just living our lives as our true selves. And as your true self, no matter what anyone that's racist may think, you would not hate other people for no reason. You just wouldn't do it if you were really connected to yourself because you would accept yourself for every part of you and that you could be any of these other people in the world. You didn't choose this life, so stop acting like it was chosen for you. And just like accept that everyone is equal and related and worthy, um, but it matters. Our perspective matters and we have to shift it even if it's into pain in order to get better. Beautifully said again. I don't see where, I, I get where it's like, oh, I can't talk about racism or say something. How could I say something compassionate to a racist about a racist? And that's going to be taken out of context. And I'm, I'm there with you in terms also of that's only going to be shifted by being compassionate and by being truthful about, I mean, I'm hearing too the, the name of your healing center, people having that good heart in them that, like you were saying, they, that person is projecting and dealing with their own fears, insecurities, pain, and these things to then say, well, let me spew that on someone else rather than addressing it for myself because of what I've been taught, because of the resources that I have access to to do it, because of the conditioning about being worthy to heal that and and then the hurt people hurting people and hurtful people doing hurtful things and yeah. I'm curious too, I like and I, the thing that you said about and I can see that in the work that you do of being able to see all of the perspectives. And so for my own selfish healing, I would be curious because I get into that too. And then my black and white thinking can go sort of to these, this other end of the bell curve extreme, where then I've used that as another way to adulter and push down my own truth because I'm like, well, I can see how that person thinks that thing. So essentially invalidating my own experience and preferences. So I'd be curious, how do you, how do you navigate holding both of those truths of that person's experience is valid and so is mine? That's a good question. And I was thinking a little bit towards the end of you talking um, that I'm just, I'm not attached to anything. I feel like I'm not attached to anything um, and I'm not averted to anything. And perhaps that has to do with the fact that I, I feel, you know, I attach, I, I, I was going to say, I have no attachments. And I'm like, I attach to, um, I relate most to Buddhist philosophy and at the core of that tradition is non-attachment and non-aversion. Now, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid only of physical pain because I know that I will likely experience physical pain when I die and I'm not ready to die. So I'm afraid of physical pain. Outside of that, I'm not afraid of shit. And that didn't used to be the case, but it is now. And so I am not afraid of being wrong. I'm not afraid of being called out. I'm not afraid of calling out. I'm not afraid of telling someone that they're wrong. Um, and not like, and I don't, I don't have the ultimate truth. So I guess I wouldn't say that someone's wrong. If they thought that they were and it wasn't working for them, I would say this isn't working versus saying you're wrong. <laughs> I, don't, I just wouldn't subscribe to that. But I think that that's part of how I do it is I'm just not attached. Like I know that everyone that I love is going to die. I know that any moment could happen where I could lose absolutely everything material. I know that I could speak out of turn or speak out of tone and be called out for it. And I've been proven wrong a lot in my life of my belief systems that I grew over time. And so I think it's like, I just really am not attached and I'm really open and accepting. And I think like, I don't think we're disconnected. So my truth is everybody's truth and everybody's truth is mine because at our core we're born the same way and we all really want the same things for our life and 
that makes us the same. So I don't know. And at the same time, I find myself shit talking all the time, which is totally random to jump into. But it's like, I have this like, and maybe that's my outlet is like, and I don't mean anything that I say. It's like this banter that I do with my husband. And he's like, you know, if someone overheard you, they would think you were such a bitch and you're not. And I think that, and I guess the reason that I'm bringing that up is that you know, I'm not trying to come off as someone that's like totally non-judgmental, which I'm not. And my human brain will be like, what the fuck is that person doing? Or something like, you know, like, because it's just our mind wants to fill the time. It doesn't want to sit there quietly. And so I think that that's important. It's yes, I'm not, I have non I practice non-aversion. I practice non-attachment and I need outlets. And so we all have those things that we do that allow us to feel like we're still in control of our life and our life is unique and our life is one of a kind and our voice matters and our opinions matter. And all of those things are important, but it's finding that balance between believing that to get by because we all have an ego <laughs> and realizing that nothing that your brain tells you is true for the most part because your brain wants you to survive and to survive you remember mostly negative things and you judge the whole entire world around you and that you are not any of those things you are i don't know you are the truth you are the truth and that's i feel like i sound psychotic saying that but i really feel that way so that's how i do it is i do it by non-judgment I do it with compassion for myself and other people, knowing that we're all the same and trying the best that I can as a human to be non-attached and non-averted. Wow. Wow, that, that did not at all feel like a non sequitur or irrelevant to me that felt, I'm really glad that you shared that again of your own real humanity that it's not this like, well, I, I meditate 10 hours a day and I never judge anyone. It's. <laughs> I'm a fucking person. I have these thoughts and then what is my awareness and, and also what are my actions with them? What am I acting based on? And mm -hmm. how am I, how am I taking that responsibility for, for it, which can include venting and saying the things in a safe and trusted place to, yeah, I, I speak mm -hmm. from having done that, like, well, I'm just, I'm going to be really Zen. And that was not truthful for me because yeah. I am not just a consciousness. I'm in a body here. <laughs> right. Like there's so much about us as humans. Like we're, we're like so human. We cannot avoid it. You know, like we really cannot avoid it. Like sometimes I think about like when I have all this shit going on in my head, I'm like, I wonder what thoughts monks have sitting on top of the mountains. Like there's, they don't just have a clear mind. Like a I mean, I've had monks come to my center in Santa Barbara, and of course they were acting monkish mm -hmm. because they were playing that role. But they're still human. Like, I'm pretty sure that like, you know, if another monk is walking by and like they had toilet paper on their shoe, they might laugh and be like, oh, like there's toilet paper on their shoe, you know? But they're not gonna be like, fuck that person's less than me because like, that's the practice. It's the practice of watching what the hell is going on in your mind, figuring out where it came from, why it's there, if you identify with it or not, if you want to continue to, and then ways that you cannot do that. And it's finding your truth, being compassionate, and realizing that your unconscious and your consciousness are connected. You are constantly absorbing stuff into your mind. And a lot of it you don't really want, but you don't have a choice over that. We can't open up the door and close the door. What we can do is look at everything that we keep absorbing, how that's coming out in our behaviors, and then if we want to change it or not. Mm. Yes, which I appreciate being so grounded and so aware of spiritual bypassing and all of those things that I find can happen with this sort of like, oh, I'm going to deny my humanity. I'm going to pretend like I'm not a human. I'm going to, and things too with like Brene Brown of putting shame in shadows where it's like, no, I'm, the ego is bad and fuck the ego of like, well, hold on. What you're, why are you denying this part of you that like you're saying keeps you safe? That is part of navigating this human suit through this life thing. Right. That then for, to go back to your definition of truth, to deny the ego from when I've done that is adultering reality. Mm -hmm. It is. That's so true. What are we doing then? 
<laughs> I'd be curious too with a lot of this stuff of and like podcasts are a funny example of this too because by definition podcasts are so heady how how it sort of translates with like mind body connection and also you brought up somatic a lot of times and and we talked about different kinds of essentially somatic therapy where we are feeling the truth in our body or expressing the truth in without words and how those again how there's space for both of those to have like your beautiful definition in succinct words of these different words and then also your the truth of your podcast and your tiktok and the things that you put out that is also you showing your truth in another way yeah well i mean i think well when you were talking about mind body connection I think that one of the primary reasons, you know, I just saw this statistic and I did not have the study attached to it, but I believe the person that put it on their website. And it said that 60% of all chronic illnesses are avoidable. They're avoidable. Why are they avoidable? Because they're caused from psychological trauma to a degree. Our immune system shuts down. We have chronic stress. We don't eat healthy. We don't sleep well. We don't have enough love and connection in our lives and enough understanding and connection to spirituality where our systems, our unconscious systems, the systems that are literally functioning, if we were knocked unconscious, our body is still functioning. And like, it's like, why do we think that we're just our mind when we're sleeping and our mind is off? Our body is still awake and still alive. And we are so connected to it but we seem to only identify with the mind, the awake mind when we are awake, but there's so much more to us than that. And so I think that it's really important. Like when I'm working, like for me, you know, and earlier I said, I have really severe anxiety. It shows up really physically and really physiologically. It's like, if I didn't know that, I would think that I could just sit in a therapy room for an hour and talk about how I'm feeling and feel better, but I can't because if you think about it, Let's say when you're in a car accident, everyone reacts differently. Some people are going to start shaking. Some people are going to freeze. Some people are going to want to get the fuck out of the car after it happens. Our body reacts in different ways, just like our mind absorbs things in different ways. Also, we're all living our own version of reality internally and externally, and that happens in our body too. So it's so important that people realize that our body, mind, and if you subscribe to this belief, your spirit as well are all connected. They all matter. And, you know, on TikTok, it's like dancing and, you know, like using your voice and doing, um, God, what is it called? Voiceovers. And like, those are all ways to express your truth and to put yourself out there. And it really helps, you know, maybe this is like an ad for TikTok right now or something, but it just helps to be creative and to use not only your mind, but also your body to, to, when people say I'm putting myself out there, I want people to see it in a different way. It's not you just arriving to put yourself out there. It's you putting yourself like your actual self out there. So if you are in any way engaging in the act of creativity, please make sure that it is your true self. And that when you say you're putting yourself out there, that you actually mean it and that you're not just still wearing the mask or the suit that other people expect you to. So it's all connected. We're all the same. We all have a fucking truth we need to find or we're going to be to a degree miserable still. Even if you don't think you are, there may be a level of happiness that you can't even imagine right now because you're not being your true self. So pick it apart. Get ready to hurt because it will set you free eventually. <laughs> Ooh, yes. Oh, that was very beautifully put again. Okay, I'd like to close with a last definition of an overlap of truth and trust and how trust comes to trust what our own truth is and trust that it's, it's safe to share, that it's safe to go through that excavation process of uncovering and putting that out there. And I'm, I'm I'm guessing, you know, as you've gone along and things you shared, your trust in yourself has shifted and your trust in your message and, and your own truth. Yeah. Well, if truth is, you know, unadulterated reality, 
then I think trust is the vulnerability that goes along with the unmasking. You know, it's when we trust someone, we're trusting that their unadulterated reality and our unadulterated reality are not going to be judged, are going to be respected. And so it's the vulnerability, like when we are being vulnerable, think about it. When we're being vulnerable, we're talking about something sensitive or something secret, or we're putting ourselves in an opportunity that may make us feel unsafe or scared. And what is feeling all of those things? What's really in there? And so I think that that, that would be how I would describe it. It's like truth is like that thing, but trust is the action of exposing that thing in some way. I love that. And again, for ending on the mind body connection of them both being relevant and how they come, how they come together. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm so excited already to listen back to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I will link all of your stuff here so that people can find you if they do not already follow you on different places and they can find your center and all of your social medias mm -hmm. and you are welcome back anytime you want to come on the podcast. This was, this was so amazing. I really appreciate your time and your sharing. You're welcome. This was really great. I am excited and I hope I can take clips from this also and put it on my platforms. That would be so great. Thank you. That would mean so much to me. Thank you so much again for coming and sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for tuning in and thanks for being you.